Hello, I'm Nelson Davis, executive producer of Making It. Over the years on this show, we've interviewed hundreds of entrepreneurs who have all kinds of goals. Some just want to make enough money working at home to buy a few little extras for the family. Others want to make a comfortable living. And then there are those aiming for the stars, knowing that if they fall short of that lofty goal, they'll still land on the moon. So on today's show, we'll revisit some of those who are flying high. They're small business owners who aren't afraid to play the game with the big dogs. And they're playing to win. Making It, featuring inspiring personal stories of struggle, triumph, and success from America's small business communities. Hello and welcome to Making It. I'm Lynette Romero. And I'm Emmett Miller. Thanks for joining us. Have you ever seen a vendor pushing a frozen dessert cart and wondered about their business? Where'd they come from? Where are they going? Do they have big dreams or are they just barely scraping by? 23 years ago, if you'd passed by Maria de Lourdes Sobrina, you might not have even given her a second glance. You might have noticed, though, her tiny storefront with the colorful sign advertising ready-to-eat gelatin cups, but you never would have known. You just passed by a $12 million company in the making. Because Maria was selling the first ready-to-eat Jell-O-type snacks in the United States, and they were an instant success. Soon, she expanded to selling to small grocers, adding puddings and frozen fruit bars to her concoctions. Today, Lulu's desserts can be found on supermarket shelves right next to industry giants like Jell-O. But the road from home kitchen to factory to corporate offices wasn't as easy or smooth as her flan. Here's more. When I told my family that I, first of all, was staying here and leaving the United States, and then I was going to start with the gelatin business, they were shocked and they were feeling ashamed of me, you know, because they say, oh, my sister is making these gelatin cups in, in California, and they probably thought I was in Broadway selling them in a push cart, no? I don't know, because, you know, gelatin are also sold in Mexico and by vendors, no, on the streets and bakeries and everywhere. But they had the wrong idea. Uh, they didn't understand that I was really trying to have a wholesale type of operation, industrial, you know. But Lulu did achieve her goal and impressed her family. Her company has been manufacturing ready-to-eat gelatins for the last 18 years. Her firm employs 100 people and is open 24 hours a day just to keep up with the demand. We actually produce about 60 to 70 million cups a year. And uh, in fruit bars, for quite a lot. Uh, I measure normally that by truckloads, so about uh, 70 truckloads of product going out. So this is quite a lot of product, quite a lot of customers too. When Lulu moved to the U.S. in 1981, she had a business in Mexico and had expanded to California and Texas. But with the downfall of the peso, she lost everything. Necessity led her to start Lulu's Desserts. At that time, um, let's say that I was a little bit uh, crazy, if you want to call it, to stay uh, here uh, with this adventure. I really call it a, an adventure. But it was the best thing I probably could do in my life. Uh, after 18 years, I tell you now. But although, uh, those years, it was hard, mainly because I didn't know anybody here. I didn't have no relatives, no friends. I was started from scratch completely, even with the English language also. It's starting to, you know, I had my, my school in, in Mexico, but, you know, this language is different, so sometimes you need to really get familiar with the, the general lifestyle here in California. So that was the first goal. The second, to establish a business. Then that's the second part that is hard because uh, I don't know, I didn't know really how to start it. But talking to people, calling people, uh, making mistakes, that's, there's no other formula here. She started out by filling 300 cups of gelatin each day by hand. Then she delivered them to mom and pop stores on consignment. But people were unfamiliar with her product and she feared that it wouldn't sell. And that was the best thing I could do because the same day when I was delivering my product in the morning, I had calls in the afternoon saying, Senora, please come back, your gelatins are gone. So that gave me, that gave me really the, 
<laughs> you know, the courage really to continue my business. Lulu's desserts continued to grow year after year, occupying two factories and adding new sizes and flavors to its product line. But Lulu learned that great success can sometimes become the biggest challenge for an entrepreneur. Moments like, for instance, in 1991, 92, that I had to leave my house in Torrance because I, I, I completely lost it. You know, financially speaking, I was going through a big growth in my factory and uh, it was not well planned. The recession was there too and I had too many debts. So at the same time I started another company, the Fruitberg Company, that uh, all, all, everything together really didn't help me. So I was ready to go <laughs> and I sent back my furniture even to Mexico. Mm -hmm. And uh, I had to give back my home to the bank and also the plant in Gardena. You know, we lost that building too. And what I did is I concentrated all my efforts. I moved to a one-bedroom apartment very close to the plant. I was at the same time very depressed because my father just recently passed away in those years. So you know that it's not easy, you know, when you're not happy, everything around you doesn't look good, no. But Lulu fought back. She'd worked too hard to accept defeat. She also knew her employees were counting on her. She paid off her debts and learned that growth has to be controlled and well-planned. And when an industry giant introduced a new product as direct competition, the outcome was different from what one might expect. When Jello started in 1992, 93, I was a little bit worried at the beginning, but uh, on the contrary, it really helped me tremendously, tremendously, the advertisement that Bill Crosby puts uh, every day in TV. Why? Because he's educating the consumer. We are very different as far as uh, quality, uh, the variety of product that I have. For instance, the 40 different products with fruit, the layers, the sizes, the six packs, the 12 packs, the individual cups. I don't think we, I mean, Jello can compete with us or we can compete against them. It's just uh, the same consumer that probably can buy, you know, my product uh, once in a while. And, um, and we offer a homemade product. That's the most important key here. It's interesting when she talks about the competition actually helping her. Yeah, you don't no, think about wonderful. that. No, you don't. You think yeah. if they say Jello, you mean Jello. No, no, right, no. no. You, right. you go to Lulu's and you get all those different varieties. I'm getting hungry thinking about it right now. <laughs> In addition to expanding her facilities and her product line, Lulu's been hard at work writing a book. It's not only the story of her extraordinary life, it's also about the lives of other Latina businesswomen and the obstacles they faced and how they overcame them. Well, Lulu is a living testament to persistence, and so is Jack Canfield, co-author of the bestseller Chicken Soup for the Soul. In Secrets of Success, he says his book was rejected 149 times before it was published. One of the principles of success that you have to master if you're going to have your business be as successful as you want is to never give up, to practice persistence, consistency of effort over time. When I went to publish the Chicken Soup for the Soul books, which have sold over 80 million copies, and now I have a company with 39 licenses, which I'm the CEO of, we were rejected 144 times. Publishers said, no one's going to publish that book. No one's interested in short stories. But the truth is, we kept at it. We actually got the book back from our agent. We took it to a book show. We went from booth to booth to booth to booth. Will you publish our book? Will you publish our book? Will you publish our book? And finally, the 145th publisher said, we'll read it. They read it, and they loved it. They published it and it went on to sell 8 million copies in 39 languages around the world. That gave me the assets that I now use to invest in my businesses and have taken me to the next level. You need to do the same thing. Never, ever give up. Okay, so we said 149 times, 144, you get the picture there. To learn more about Jack Canfield and his latest book, The Success Principles, visit his website at www.thesuccessprinciples.com. And for more secrets of success, just log on to our website at www.makingittv.com. Coming up next, is she an athlete, an engineer, a lawyer, or a footwear mogul? The answer, all the above. And you'll meet this astonishing entrepreneur when we come back. Supporting the entrepreneurial spirit in America, Making It is being brought to you by Honda, the power of dreams, and by Sempra Energy, a Fortune 500 energy services company committed to building a diverse supplier base.
those the only two choices, bitten or swallowed? Yeah, too bad, huh? <laughs> Welcome back to Making Aid. How hard is it to compete against the big dogs of business? Well, take the case of our next fearless entrepreneur. She successfully sued a multinational shoe company when she felt that their shoes too closely resembled her designs. On today's Best of Making It, we're revisiting some of our favorite entrepreneurs that you've met through the years. And when you hear the story of Lavetta Willis, you'll see why she made the grade. Truly a Renaissance woman, Lavetta was a basketball star at Notre Dame where she majored in engineering. And after graduating, she went to work for IBM. She then decided to pursue law school. Though turned down at first, Lavetta's persistence eventually paid off. She was admitted to Loyola Law School and was convinced this was her ticket to becoming a big-time sports agent. But with all of her drive, she just couldn't overcome the one thing she couldn't change. Yeah, get this. Lavetta was told she'd never make it as a sports agent because she was a woman. She was shocked, dismayed, and really, really upset when she was told to try sports where it said. The clothing industry held little appeal for her until she remembered just how uncomfortable, ill-fitting, and downright ugly her sports gear was in college. That step led her into running Dada Footwear. Footwear company will do about 30 million in sales this year. Um, we have 20 million, 25 employees domestically and 10 between China and Taiwan. In 1998, you came out with a new shoe that you were going to sell on the basis of performance. Why would a consumer buy Dada as opposed to a name brand? We started in the apparel industry, so we were shipping apparel to the Foot Locker, Foot Action and Finish Line, Hibbits, which are like the core customers as far as our athletic brands concerned. So we were out there and the name was hot anyway. So we were like, you know what, we need a shoe because we were having to hook our apparel up with Nike and other brands because, you know, people like to buy the hookup. They like to buy the hat, the shirt, and the shoes to match. We're like, you know what, let's make our own shoes. So we decided it was time for us to make our own shoes so we can decide some color trends on our, on our own. So we decided to do a shoe, and we knew that the brand was hot, and if we came up with a good product that performed, that people would buy a product as well. You actually began this business with a partner. Tell us about that relationship. Lance is incredible. <laughs> he's a designer. He's a creative force here. He does all our in-house. We do, people say, oh, do you do an ad agency? Your ads are so great. I'm like, no, Lance did that. So he does all the creative. And I met him when I was doing another apparel line. And I was actually looking for a graphic artist to do some artwork for me. And I ran into him, and it was perfect. Give us a sense of the process from concept to design to actually seeing the shoe in a shoe store. Okay, you look at the trend, and so you're like, okay, what's happening now? I mean, a while ago, I can give you an example, the big thing was fade on shoes. We're like, okay, I think this is coming, we're going to do a fade. We're like, well, what's coming after the fade? So we're like, okay, it's going to be a print. So Lance will sit back and he'll do some concepts, like, okay, how about this shoe, how about that shoe? He may, he may do like 20 designs, and we'll sit down and say, okay, we don't like that one. We may come up with two. After we decide, you know what, we think these shoes are going to be pretty good, let's get them sampled. We'll give them to development, which is R&D, which I took you to of R&D. They'll do an SRF, which is like a, a request form for a sample. So they'll do an SRF and we'll shoot it over to Taiwan and you get a sample back. But in the meantime, we'll take that design, give it to our graphics guys, they'll scan it in, put it on the computer, do some color ups so we can see how it's kind of working with color. And then, you know, we'll send that over to the factory as well so we can get those colors back. And so from Lance designing something to us getting the actual sample back can be as fast as three weeks or as long as 60 days, depending on how complex the shoe is. Speed is an advantage? Speed right now in athletic footwear is an advantage because right now athletic footwear is kind of going to this fashion thing. It has to be cool, it has to look good, and it has to be on the trends. Like right now, girls are wearing rhinestones on everything. So you know what, we're going to do a shoe with a rhinestone crown. How fast can somebody else get that done? What happens if you miss? If you miss, you have a bad shoe, and that's not good. And in our industry, and being a small company trying to make a name athletic footwear, where you have Nike, Adidas, and Reebok, there's no room for a mistake. So it's really tough for us because you're just as good as your last shoe. And, you know, your buyers will tell you that. <laughs> so it's hard to make a mistake. So we really try hard not to miss. And we've been pretty good right now. I mean, we've been in business for three years now, and I think we've had, like, maybe two misses. So that's not bad. Nike may spend $20 million on an advertising campaign, but you don't have that kind of money. How do you compensate? Just being creative. We do different things that don't cost as much money. We'll do marketing campaigns, street campaigns, street marketing. You know, they call it guerrilla marketing. I don't necessarily call it that. I call it target marketing because in the South, there may be an artist that's hot down there. Then we're going to do postcards with that artist down there. Or we use the slang term that they're using down there. So you just relate to every industry or to every, you know, territory. And we do it that way. Just, you just have to be creative. Things we can't spend money on like they do. So we're not, you're not going to see a national campaign at the Super Bowl with a dot 
a footwear commercial. It's not happening. But you know, we'll do BT and we'll do 15 second spots, so we'll do product placement, which is a big thing for us. Lavetta, you're playing in the league with giants. At any point in time, you could be crushed. How close have you actually come to being stepped on by the big boys? We'll never be crushed, but right now we're close. <laughs> because we're in a lawsuit right now over a new technology that we're, that we're launching, which we're super excited about. It's called Sosonic Force on the Drawlix platform, which happens to be something that Nike feels is similar to what they're doing. It's not. Our part's been patented since 1994. It's mechanical cushion. There's this foam. It's totally different. This heel cup here has never been done before. This mold, it took like, you know, like 12 different molds just to make the one, this one part. So it's very complicated. And really only one place in Taiwan can really actually do it. And we're glad they think it's similar. You know, uh, we think it's going to sell well in the store. But this is the closest I think I've been to saying, you know what, I'm going to the mattresses on this one. <laughs> So I'm going with it, and we're going to ship our shoe, and it's going to sell. And you know what? Let's be competitive, Nike. Compete with us on even, you know, even grounds. And we think this technology is going to put us there. You're a new mother. That must represent a huge challenge. How are you balancing motherhood and being a businesswoman? He's here. He's here with me all the time. I go back and forth all day. And then the buyers, if I'm on the phone, they hear him in the back. They're like, oh, how's hell? You know, so everybody understands. And so it's fun because it's a little bit of a release because it's super stress here. It's like super stress with everything that's going on right now. So it's a good rela release and it helps you put things back in perspective. Well, you know, the shoes don't only have to look good. They've got to be comfortable. They've got to work. You know, people are athletic. And they've it's got to be current. The thing is that market changes so yeah. fast now. Way back in the day, you'd have a shoe would be out there for right. months. Now it's like a couple of weeks and suddenly right. they want something new. I want rhinestones on my tennis. <laughs> I like get, that. I'll get you some. <laughs> yeah. Well, Lavetta has successfully settled both lawsuits with Nike. Dada now grosses $40 million a year in sales. Unbelievable. The expansion includes celebrity endorsements, Italian design gym shoes, and a new line of women's sportswear. And still ahead, do you have what it takes to stand among giants, a titan of industry, Litton Industries, to be precise? has the inside scoop. Former VP Jerry Weissman is here with us live when we come on back. All right, here's how you can get in touch with some of the entrepreneurs you've met on today's show. You can reach Maria Delorda Sobrina at lulusdessert.com and you can contact Lavetta Willis at dadafootwear.com. Now here's Lynette Romero with today's studio guest, Jerry Weissman. Thanks, Emmett. Jerry Weissman is the former vice president of strategic planning for Linton Industries. He currently provides volunteer consulting services to nonprofit agencies and small business owners. Welcome to Making It. We appreciate you being with us here today. Well, that's great to be here. Now we've talked a lot about competition in today's show. What's the number one thing a small business vendor should do when they're vying for contracts with a multi-billion dollar company? Well, I think they have to do the same thing that anyone has to do. They really need to understand your customer. They need to figure out the niche that they fill well, but put themselves in their customer's place and think what's most important to the customer. And then make sure that you satisfy those needs. And in fact, more than satisfy, I used to work with somebody who coined a phrase, delighting the customer. And I really like that. Right. That's going that step beyond. I mean, that competition can really be a good thing in terms of making yourself better. It can be. And you really need to focus on quality and on uh, your performance. Right. Now, one of today's entrepreneurs also mentioned the benefits of uh, joining trade organizations. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think that works very well for small business, works for large business as well. But it's an opportunity to network with your peers, your competitors, it's an opportunity to meet your customers and typically your possibly your suppliers as well. And they all may be part of the same trade organization. The other part of it is it gives you an opportunity to be heard in the political process. In particular as a small business, it's very hard to to make that case yourself, but through a trade organization you can often advance things that are of, of importance to you. Now, in your capacity as Vice President of Strategic Planning for Litton Industries, you often subcontracted with smaller firms. Tell us some of the lessons that you learned in doing that. Well, I think probably the, the way that small businesses get in trouble with, with dealing with large businesses is to overstep, is to uh, oversell what they can do, mm -hmm. to come in and reach too high and either the large business sees that and dismisses them out of hand or 
perhaps is fooled and lets them take on something that they can't do and then they don't perform on it. And the thing that you really don't want to do is to fail. And most right. large businesses, if they're subcontracting to somebody small, what they want is they want a success. Right. Outsourcing, it's a hot button topic. Um, everybody has an opinion about it, but what can small companies do to stay competitive in today's international economy? Okay. Well, of course, outsourcing is, is the, the ability actually for small business to get something mm -hmm. I and mean, that's being outsourced but today yeah we normally think of it as as competing offshore and again I think you'd have to focus on your service to that customer the the fact that you can be nimble that you're here uh, that that your people can can be in touch with with the the customer more directly than an offshore factory would because I think that you're not going to be competitive trying to compete with people who are maybe making far less money than your employees. Right. But you ought to be able to provide better service, quicker service, higher quality. So really identifying the customer that you're trying to delight. That you exactly. And, and finding their hot buttons and really focusing on mm -hmm. them. Now, you were part of the team that sold Litton Industries. It's a huge company, obviously. And, and they were sold to Northrop Gr uh, Grumman, an even larger corporation. You must have learned a lot of lessons in doing that as well. Yeah, I think. Again, one of the things that I've talked about, we, we tried uh, to really understand what Northrop's business were and tried to put ourselves in the position of what would be important to them. Why were they interested in us as best we could and tried to show ourselves in the best light along that line. We tried, as we described each of our businesses, to tell them why we thought it would really supplement theirs, what mm -hmm. would be good for them. And then also within that, I think, again, something very important in business, the, the value of integrity, telling the truth, being straight on that, because the, that process of, of being bought, being looked at to be bought, involves a real undressing. They're going to get deeper and deeper into it, and you, you need to maintain your, the truthfulness of what you're saying. I know you want to talk about, real quickly about your volunteer consultant. Can you talk about it real quick? Yeah. Ten seconds? Less? Sure. Okay. <laughs> I volunteer, do business consulting for an organization called SCORE. We provide counseling. We provide face-to-face -face free business counseling to small businesses. Okay. I love it. Great. We're going to tell people how they can get more information about that. Thanks great. so much for being with us. Lots of great welcome. information. Um, also, if you would like uh, to hear more about this, about Jerry Weissman, and we'll tell you about that right after this, and also we'll tell you about Outsource LA. I'm sorry, SCORE LA. We'll be right back. Where small business is the big idea. Making it is being brought to you by the Disneyland Resort in California, where you can experience a whole new world of magic at every turn. Also by the Boeing Company. And by Southern California Edison. For over 100 years, life powered by Edison. All right, you can reach Jerry Weissman by calling 818 818- 552-3206 or log on to scorela.org. And if you'd like to get a copy of today's show or to find other small business resources, just log on to our website at makingittv.com. And that's our show for this week. I'm Emmett Miller. Thanks for joining us. And I'm Lynette Romero. We'll see you next time right here on Making It. Budding young authors eager to start on their first novel are often advised to write what you know. For aspiring business owners, the advice would be, start from where you stand, begin with what you've got. Well, for some, this means simply drawing upon their own cultural background. On today's Making It, we'll talk to entrepreneurs who may not have realized that the rich heritage they lived as children could make them monetarily rich later in life. I'm Nelson Davis, and the theme today is honoring your heritage, right now on Making It. Making It, 
featuring inspiring personal stories of struggle, triumph, and success from America's small business communities. And I'm Lynette Romero. Welcome to Making It. Our first story on today's show reads something like a, a novel. From royalty to refugee to riches again. Now this is the tale of a princess turned pauper who now reigns in the kitchen of an upscale Beverly Hills Bistro. We're all familiar with the fall of Saigon, but the family saga of our next entrepreneur stretches back much further. Elizabeth Ahn was part of a dynasty, one of the ancient ruling families in Vietnam. But when the communists seized power, the Ahns lost theirs. Their fortune, their homeland, their life as they knew it was gone forever. The resourcefulness they have shown and their ability to bounce back is nothing less than astounding. While life could not have been bleaker just three decades ago, today they rule a $30 million a year restaurant empire. It's cooked up from their heritage. When we first arrived here, we lost everything. And um, it's when communists took over a country, they, you know, everything is taken from you. Her story begins around the time of the Vietnam War. While in Vietnam, Elizabeth Ahn lived a life of privilege. My great-grandfather was the vice king of Vietnam. And so for generations, we, you know, we had a lifestyle where for myself, I had uh, my own nanny, each of my sister, we had our own nannies. And it was very different. We, I never went into the kitchen. When Elizabeth turned eight, communists invaded. They overthrew the aristocrats, turning her life upside down. One evening, um, my mother basically said, get your things, Elizabeth. We're going to, uh, we need to leave right now. We're going to go to look for, for, um, for your grandmother. Grandma Ahn had been living in San Francisco. Four years earlier, while on vacation in America, she had the foresight to buy a deli as property in the event of a coup. The next thing I knew, we were shipped into, pushed into a uh, military cargo plane and shoved in the back of the plane like sardines in a can, and uh, we were taken to a refugee camp. Arriving in California, they soon settled in San Francisco. Seven family members shared a one-bedroom apartment located on top of the deli. For two years, that was our lifestyle. And slowly, slowly, you know, I grew up learning the family business, watching my grandmother and my mother, you know, worked the little deli that we had here and uh, slowly, slowly turned it to the first Vietnamese restaurant. In time, the restaurant, Tan Long, quadrupled in size. By the time Elizabeth grew up, she had even bigger plans to do more. I dabbled a little bit in fashion. And being in fashion, you know, I had this fantasy of having, you know, a fashionable restaurant. I always feel that food and fashion goes together, that I could bring my fashion crowd too and I couldn't really bring them to grandma and mom's deli out in the avenues so I said I said to the family you know why don't we open a more fashionable place in the middle of San Francisco but the family initially rejected the idea fearing the possibility of losing anything more I was just very persistent and wouldn't take no for an answer and at the end of the day my mother was just very very um, supportive always and she always believed in us. The first crustacean opened in San Francisco, the second in Beverly Hills. Today, Beverly Hills is the flagship restaurant with great food, an underground aquarium, and of course, some very well-known VIPs. I think it's just the dynamic of Beverly Hills. The city itself just bring in people, and we had a great location. Um, we had just incredible support from the community. And um, from day one, um, we were well received. The Beverly Hills restaurant cost two and a half million dollars to set up. Elizabeth says that was recouped in two years. The five sisters help run the business while mom Helene takes care of the food. Helene's cooking is what makes crustacean. Crustacean is not typically Vietnamese, it's Helene's cuisine. And Hel Helene's cuisine is all about our heritage and our tradition. Crustacean is a combination of French, Chinese and Vietnamese cuisine. Recipes for items like its crab and garlic noodles are kept hidden in a secret kitchen. It is a kitchen within a kitchen. It's completely concealed in stainless steel. 
As Coca-Cola have their secret recipes in a vault, we have my mother's recipe in the secret kitchen. The two crustaceans became so popular, the Ahn family decided to expand to Las Vegas. But that restaurant, at a cost of $12 million, would prove to be the bump in the road. We thought going into a new location that we could call it a, uh, not crustacean, but a different restaurant. And that was our long-term thought of, you know, maybe selling it one of these days and just keeping one restaurant to the on family. So we thought, why don't we have a new restaurant, uh, modify the concept, give it a different name so we can grow with that and then sell it. So, but we underestimated our brand name. With no secret kitchen either, customers didn't connect the restaurant with the on family. That forced the Ons to make some changes and the restaurant in Las Vegas finally started to pick up on its own. We changed the name, first of all, to Crustacean, so basically rebranding ourselves and establishing our identity and as more of an institution. And when we called it Crustacean, immediately we got the um, response. What we had to do is, Mother had to come up with a secret kitchen, modified version of a menu for, for Vegas, where we have the crab and the garlic noodles, but it's prepared a little bit different. Though the restaurant is now doing well, Elizabeth says it still hasn't made a profit. And even though she's learned a big lesson about expanding, she says that won't stop her from growing some more. I love to do something in Chicago. We love to have something in New York and London. So that's probably the, the direction that we'll go. Chicago first, New York, and then London. With each new location opened will come more need for family. Elizabeth says when she runs out of family members here in America, no need to worry, Vietnam still has many more. I'm intrigued by that secret kitchen. You oh, know? yeah, the secret kitchen, yeah. <laughs> and that's probably, I guess that's what worked. Everybody likes that. Sure. Interesting. Well, in addition to the restaurants, the Ahn family sells their own secret kitchen sauces at high-end grocery stores. One of their next ventures will be to sell frozen hors d'oeuvres based on the delicacies that have made crustacean such a big hit. And do they have the ingredients on the, uh, when they sell nope, them? Nope, top secret. Yeah, okay. <laughs> The Ahn family was at the forefront of this explosive growth of ethnic food when they opened up their first cafe 25 years ago. So, in Secrets of Success, author Carlos Caneo explains why marketing to diverse cultures makes such sound financial sense. How would you like a $1.3 trillion business opportunity? That's right. You see, this amount represents the three fastest growing multicultural market segments in America. The African American, the Asian, and the Hispanic markets. See, tapping these three markets goes way beyond affirmative action and political correctness. This is sound business strategy to tap into the sheer numbers out there to create success for our businesses in this unpredictable economy. And in today's highly competitive marketplace, you're either leading edge, dull edge or trailing edge and learning to deal with the specialized ways of doing business with people from other cultures will create new opportunities and outrageous business opportunities in the 21st century will go to those that are quickly and effectively able to adapt and understand these new ways in a diverse environment you can reach Carlos Caneo at Multicultural Associates. His phone number is 800-494-0378. And you can hear more Secrets of Success by logging on to our website, Making It TV. Coming up, Ethiopian priests painting pictures. It's the inspiration for our next entrepreneur right after this break. Where small business is the big idea, Making It is being brought to you by The Boeing Company. And by Sempra Energy, a Fortune 500 energy services company committed to building a diverse supplier base. And welcome back to Making It. Today we're talking to entrepreneurs who are making a living as adults by drawing upon their childhood heritage. So how much would you pay for a valuable piece of art? Last year, one person paid more than $100 million in an auction at Sotheby's for a painting by Pablo Picasso. That shattered the world's previous record of $82 million paid for a Van Gogh. And if those figures seem staggering to you, they probably don't surprise Alitash Kabede. 
She's always looked at art as an investment, even though her greatest challenge has been to convey that idea to other people. Her love of art began as a girl in Addis Ababa, where she was surrounded by pieces purchased by her father. He was particularly passionate about paintings done by priests. It's a long-standing tradition for Ethiopian parishioners to purchase their art and then donate it back to the church. Living in Los Angeles, Alatash was dismayed to find no long-standing tradition of supporting African-American painters. So it was here that she found her niche. There is no doubt that art is probably one of the best investments. When I first started out 20 years ago, I could not say that because I don't have an experience of anything having investment, and you know, having had an investment value. Alitash Kabede got that start by displaying and selling art in New York in the 1980s, where she immersed herself in the culture and community of the artists. Because of my love and, and uh, interest in art and artists, um, they, you know, uh, all of them used to say, you should, you should, you should uh, represent my work or something like that, you know. And um, uh, of course I thought it was too good to be true, to be making a living, you know, working with art. But here it is, 20 years later, I, I'm doing it. It was an affinity that started when Alatash was just a child in her native Ethiopia. There, her father developed a tradition of exposing her to paintings from a non-traditional source. In Ethiopia, there's a tradition of church paintings that, in other words, the, the deacons from the church uh, are painters. They produce paintings that is usually bought by uh, lay people and donated back to the church as a gift, you know? And you, you, usually people don't hang those pe pieces in their homes, but we had plenty of those in our home. After moving to the United States and graduating college, Kabede noticed a particular void in the world of art African-American artists were not marketing themselves to African-American buyers. I said to myself, my God, I must make a difference in this. Um, if, if people knew, they would be interested in, in, in these works of artists that were, you know, they were represented in museums, they were in, you know, major collections and whatnot, but they didn't really have, um, People did not know about them, and, and particularly in the West Coast. In, in, in New York, there is um, a community that you know, knows about you know, the artists and whatnot. You know, it may not be a you know, very wide one. You know, the art community is very small anyway. But in the West Coast, there was none. Alatash moved to Los Angeles, where artists allowed her to sell their works on consignment. But she noticed that customers weren't exactly beating down her door. At that time, I had like collages by Romare Bearden for $3,000. Those were works that would sell today for $100,000, you know, but still $3,000 was a lot of money. I remember one time someone coming to me and seeing a work of Romare Bearden and it was $750. It was a print. And <clears throat> she asked me how much it was and I said $750. And I thought, she thought I was talking about $7.50. That's what I was dealing with at the time. After selling from her home for a time, she realized that to educate the consumer, the pieces she was presenting needed a larger venue. Galleries are like, you know, like in the, when you think of them in the right way, they're like, a, you know, small museums. I'm mean, like, as you could see right now, the, the exhibition that we have, something on a big scale could be at a museum. And so I wanted the, the, the reason why I decided to, to take up a gallery space is because the, the artist could get a wider um, visibility as opposed to being a private dealer and it's only with the people that I know. This way it's, it's open to the public. While most of her revenue is from sales of pieces, many would be surprised to know there are other ways for art galleries to make money. We generate income from these traveling exhibitions when the museums who rent them, you know, pay us a rental fee. So some of, that, uh, some of that income goes into supporting the gallery as well. For most businesses, competition derives from within the same industry. Kabede says for her, this is not true. But people would rather buy things that has um, 
um, sort of like, uh, how would you say it, the, the cars. And, uh, and, and even in, in, I mean, when you're talking about places like Los Angeles, you have competitions with the Pradas and the, the Louis Vuittons and whatnot. And people can, can spend money on, you know, astronomical amount of money on handbags and whatnot. But when you're talking about, and I'm talking about people that I know, friends. And while the Alatash Kabede Art Gallery continues to do well financially, she says there are even more valuable reasons why she's passionate about art. It's important to surround yourself with, you know, art that you, you can enjoy with your family. And not only that, that you can pass along to your children and generations of your children. And the kind of artwork that we sell are those kind of artwork, and that makes me feel good. Incredible. It's so different, too. Yeah, it really is. It's very unique. Yeah. And Alatash does have her work cut out for her. She said once she had a lot of trouble convincing a famous athlete to see the value of spending $20,000 on a painting, yet he had just shelled out a quarter of a million dollars for a stereo system. Hmm, what's up with that? Coming up next, could you draw upon your culture to start a business? Our studio guest is a specialist in entrepreneurial thinking, and she will have a few tips for you. Jody Walker of Secret Alliances, Success Alliances, is our guest today. Don't go away. Okay, so here's how you can get in touch with some of the entrepreneurs you may have seen on today's show. You can reach Elizabeth on at Crustacean. The website is onfamily.com. And you can contact Alitash Kabede at Alitash Kabede Gallery. Her website is alitashkgallery.com. And now, let's join Lynette with our studio guest, Jody Walker. Thanks, Emmett. Jody is an author, public speaker, and the president of Success Alliances. It's an organization that teaches the discipline of entrepreneurial thinking. Welcome to Making It. Thank you. First of all, entrepreneurial thinking, what exactly is that? Entrepreneurial thinking, if I could sum it up in a few words, I would really say it's taking personal ownership for results. So getting everyone at every level of the organization to really do some of the things that an owner would do. Take that personal ownership for all of the results at every level. Right. Now when you talk about people having a culture, everybody has some kind of culture to draw upon. Now is this the first place people should look to when they're going to start their own business? It's one place to look. It's not the only place. I think what's so great about looking at your heritage and that particular aspect is that it is authentic. It's you. It's the very essence of you. It comes from your heart. So you can draw a lot of passion around that. But there are so many things in terms of starting a business that you would have to look at in addition to that for it to be a true success. A lot of people try to separate that, but it's, it's not necessary to do that because that does give you the passion that you really need, right? Absolutely. I think, I think it definitely does. It adds something that g may give you the edge in right. the competitive marketplace. It's another dimension. Now, you have over 20 years of business sales and training experience. How do you use all that knowledge to make this work for your customers? What I do is I really try to start with the leadership because what I've found is if you're building a culture in an organization, Organization, which is what we try to do to build a culture of entrepreneurial thinkers, people that are taking that personal ownership, which does affect everything from customer service mm -hmm. uh, to productivity, is to find ways to help the leaders help the folks that work with them or for them. And part of that, that is acknowledgement. One of the things that the frontline employees are desperate for in the research is they really want more acknowledgement. And sometimes when corporations get bigger and bigger, uh, that aspect sometimes dwindles. Right. So you mean being appreciated, acknowledgement, that kind of thing. They just Absolutely. want to know that you notice that they're there. Absolutely. Know that they're there and certainly valuing the employee as the customer. This is something that Southwest Airlines does very well. And I had the mm -hmm. opportunity to, to interview Colleen Barrett, who is now the president of Southwest Airlines. And she was Herb Kelleher's secretary uh, for many years and then started in the customer service area with him helping build the customer service for Southwest Airlines and now is running the company. Hmm. And her whole philosophy is around that area of treating your employees as the number one customer. Right. And they, that's why they have a lot of fun, and, and that has been a big aspect of their success. And that will make you money. Absolutely. <laughs> and it has. <laughs> well, just because a business owner knows his or her culture, now should they presume to think that that's what their customers will know as well? Absolutely not. Right. Absolutely not. I think that could be a, 
uh, very short-sighted because we tend to make assumptions sometimes and one of the things entrepreneurs in starting businesses it's, it's always interesting because they are oftentimes considered to be great risk takers but actually they're calculated risk takers right so they look at all of this information so in addition to just the culture one of the things that they would want to look at are all of these other areas that would affect the types of customers that would be coming into their business now you're a motivational speaker. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about that. What happens to somebody where they need a motivational speaker to kind of get them back on their feet? Well, I think it's interesting because I don't think there is such a thing as a true motivational speaker. We like to think that certainly we can make an impact uh, and perhaps change some perceptions in their thinking, but the true motivation is internal. Mm -hmm. And so what we try to do is to give them insights and allow them to go inside to really think about how it affects them personally. And then with that, the internal motivation is what has to kick in, whether it's for you as an entrepreneur yourself or if you're working within a company because so many organizations have had struggles with low morale, mm -hmm. a lot of changes going on, outsourcing of jobs, all sorts of things going on. And when that's happening, you have to keep the troops and the morale high, right. and you have to value them if you really want that to happen. Now, people have that in there somewhere, and sometimes they lose their way. Is it because things get complicated? How does that happen? I think it gets complicated. And do you mean from the leadership perspective? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I think it gets far too complicated than it needs to be, right. actually, far too complicated. Because when we do the research, and again, when we've interviewed some of these folks, it's some of the very simple things that people are wanting, the everyday thank you. I mean, people are being asked to do more with less, day in and day out. And many of the companies that I work with are struggling with that same aspect. But if you're going to build a culture, you can't ask your employees to be entrepreneurial thinkers and be creative and be risk takers and do all those things if it's not supported exactly. by the leadership. Exactly. It won't work. Okay. Thank you so much. Great information. Great. We really appreciate it. Now we're going to tell you how you can get in touch with Jody Walker and Success Alliances right after this break. So stick around. Celebrating America's economic dream, Making It is being brought to you by Honda, the power of dreams. Southern California Edison, for over 100 years, life powered by Edison. And by the Disneyland Resort in California, where you can experience a whole new world of magic at every turn. And you can reach Jody Walker at Success Alliances. The number is 1-800-782-1719. And be sure to visit our website at makingittv.com. And there you can find a list of small business resources and learn how to submit stories to our show. And if you'd like a copy of this episode, you can order that from the website as well. Entrepreneurship seems like one of those things where it's not just starting the company, building the company. Yeah. you got to own the company. You have to be present at all times. You know, those people who disappear, you just can't do that anymore. Yeah, and you really have to know where you're going and where you've been. Mm -hmm. So it's a much, much wider scope than even we imagined when we began the show, but thank That's you for right. joining us on the show this week. I'm Emmett Miller. And I'm Lynette Romero. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time right here on Making It. To keep customer coming, I learned that you must be personable and you must care. I saw my grandmother caring for each of her guests as if they were her friends coming to her home every day.